Let's do it. All righty. Okay, well, thank you once again for joining us. Um, uh, today we are talking about how to fast track your environmental targets. Uh, so my name is Rose. Uh, some of you might have already seen me from previous webinars that we have hosted. Um, I'm the head of content community here at Food Steps. Uh, so that means I spend most of my time supporting our outbound communications uh, for Food Steps in particular. But I also spend a good amount of my time uh, supporting our clients with their own communications when it comes to talking about their sustainable uh, food initiatives or helping to educate their own workforce on their sustainability initiatives. But I'll talk a bit more about that towards the end of the webinar. So, uh, as I said, this is me. Hi, I'm Rose, uh, and this is Maura. Maura's gonna introduce herself in just a moment. Um, so let's just do a quick recap of why we're actually here. Uh, so we're gonna be going over the basics as that any food business needs uh, to basically engage and transform their supply chain when it comes to calculating and measuring your impact. We're also gonna be recapping some of the best tools uh, when it comes to measuring um, and how you can turn your data into new targets. And then we're also gonna share some little like tips and tricks uh, that you as a food business can actually use uh, to reduce your impact across your supply chain. So we are gonna be talking a lot about supply chain today, but we will be talking about some other things. Um, so who are we? So those of you who aren't familiar about who Food Steps actually are. So we offer a range of services, both off the shelf and bespoke to help food businesses like you get to grips uh, with your food data and then use it and make more meaningful actions towards net zero, whichever particular environmental targets that we're talking about today that you might be trying to work towards. Uh, so this works in terms of like we do carbon labels, uh, which can help you rate your products from A to E basis. Um, and then we also do things like scope three. There's lots of bespoke offerings that we have. So I won't be able to talk about all of them here. And that's not why we're here today to talk about how amazing we are. Um, and here are some of the clients uh, that we have worked with. So these are our wonderful customers. Uh, and we're thrilled to have uh, a, such a varied roster of organizations who trust us enough to help them measure, reduce, and communicate their uh, food and beverage or F&B impact at scale. So uh, let's just get into it. We've got a good amount of people here. So I'm gonna pass you off to the very capable hands of Maura. So, uh, Maura, take it away. Thanks, Rose. Um, hi, guys. Uh, I'm Maura. I am a senior LCA analyst here at Food Steps, um, where what I do is I spend most of my time supporting our clients and our partners on their environmental impact measurement efforts. So today, I am going to talk a little bit about getting you started on your own impact measurement journey. Um, and as with any big project or decision, you want to do a little bit of soul searching ahead of time to make sure that you're clear on both the intention and the aim of your measurement. So I've broken down this process into three questions that will hopefully help you set off on the right foot. The first of which is, what are your goals? And this is looking at why are you measuring your food's environmental impacts? The next one is what frameworks are available to help you measure impact. So that's what are you measuring in order to achieve your goals? And I will highlight a couple of those options later on. And then next we have what is inside and outside of your organizational control. So that's really how are you going to measure what you set out in those frameworks that I highlighted um, and what data do you already have or what data will you need to ask for? So starting at the beginning, we have what are your goals? Um, before we start thinking about data or anything all that technical, it's really important to think about why you want to measure the impact of your food and what your goals are for using these measurements. So the goals of your impact measurements will be something that you return to throughout the process and they will help with decision-making around areas such as how much resource you need to dedicate to your project, um, where do you need to focus your data collection efforts and how are you gonna measure the success of this project? So it's really kind of your North Star um, on some of the more technical pieces of impact measurement. 
hopefully everyone on this call has the general goal of reducing the environmental impact of their food products, but I have listed out a few more specific goals that many of our clients come to us with. Um, obviously your goals might look a little bit different. That's totally okay. Starting at the top here, we have the first goal of wanting to submit to the science-based targets initiative or another reporting body, or maybe you want to start to use that reporting to formulate a net zero target. My colleague Rose is going to speak a little bit more on this topic later on in the session. A, another goal is that you might have a few products or a few ingredients that you want to look at in greater detail to be able to identify hotspots across your supply chain um, and start to reduce them. And then third, we have maybe you're looking to market or bring attention to some of the lower impact products or recipes within your business, or you really want to stand out and distinguish yourself against your competitors for your sustainability efforts. So these are three goals that you might have. And these are really big picture goals. Um, once you've defined the big picture, you also have the ability to refine these down even further and narrow the scope of the assessment. That's something I'd really recommend. So if you're looking at that second goal there um, of trying to identify hotspots across your supply chain, you might want to go one step further and say, actually, you know, I really just want to look at packaging and understand the role that that plays in the impact of my product. That's even more specific. And that's really going to help you when you're choosing a framework of assessment and finding data. So whatever your goal is, clearly defining it ahead of time will help you move towards that next step. And that is determining what frameworks are available to help measure impact. So as I mentioned before, thinking about assessment frameworks is really when we get into the what of impact measurement, and that's the way you define what you need to measure and what your outputs are going to look like. So um, here at Foodsteps, life cycle assessments or LCAs are at the center of everything we do. So it's worth noting that even though you won't see the words life cycle assessment anywhere on the next slides, each of these assessment frameworks have at their core the use of LCA data and methodologies. They just use this data a little bit differently and, and the specificity of the assessments will vary. So I've identified three potential assessment frameworks. We have a lot of threes today. Um, and you will be able to use these to measure impact and see hopefully that they line up pretty closely with those goals that I previously stated. So. First off, we have scope one to three or corporate level reporting. And this is a framework that has been defined by the greenhouse gas protocol to allow companies to report and track their greenhouse gas emissions across their full company operations. You'll see in this hint that this is a really great framework for assessment if you're looking to submit to SBTI or to formulate a net zero target. So for scope one and two emissions, what this is is largely focused on energy use, and that is both from sources that are directly owned by your company and those that are purchased. Scope three, however, is of particular relevance to food businesses as this level of reporting looks at emissions from across the supply chain, and that's including most notably the food and drink that you are procuring. Um, it's been estimated that this can make up anywhere from 95% of a food business's emissions. Um, so it's clearly important to dig a little bit deeper into scope three. Um, here at Food Steps, we use what's called the volume-based method to calculate scope three emissions. And what that is, is we match the volume of different food items procured to our database of emissions factors for specific foods. We come up with kind of a total pool of emissions, and this allows us to get a a lot more accurate of a number than some of the other methods for scope three emissions, such as spend-based calculations. The pros of corporate level reporting are that it's really thorough um, in that it looks at your operations holistically, but a scope three assessment also lacks some of the specificity of the other frameworks on this list. Next off, we have product level reporting. Um, and this is a form of life cycle assessment that's focused not on your full company, but instead just on one product or a series of products. Um, it's a really great tool for measurement if you're specifically looking to understand hotspots in that supply chain. So 
product level footprinting is generally more detailed than corporate level assessments. And here at Food Steps, we perform these assessments looking at the life cycle of the product from farm to fork or even past fork into food waste. So what that involves is looking at this little graphic here, um, collecting as much data as possible on everything from the inputs that go into growing the ingredients for your product on the farm through to the types of processing that they undergo and the packaging, as well as inputs to that those processes, such as energy and water use. We have transportation, emissions from the sale and distribution of your products, and then through to that household stage and any waste and losses that occur there. Depending on what your goals um, are and the scope of your assessment, we might focus data collection a little bit more strongly on one area or another. So if we're looking at a tomato, um, we're probably going to focus pretty much on the farm stage and all of those impacts. But if the product is maybe packaged crisps or something that um, is going on at supermarket shelves, it might be more important to collect some data from the processing and packaging stages. The pros of product level footprinting are that it provides a lot more specific picture of the hotspots in the production of a given product. And you can be sure that the assessment is specifically tailored to your operations and moving away from average figures. This is really great if you want to intervene in your supply chain or if you want to eventually start to get into labeling. Um, but the breadth is obviously a bit more limited given the specificity of the assessment. And then finally, we have recipe level footprinting. This is somewhat more specific to food service businesses, but it looks at the composition of your recipes and menus in greater detail. Um, this framework for assessment is really great for businesses that want to bring attention to low carbon recipes that are already on their menus or maybe design new menus with more lower carbon options. Outside of obviously the recipe's ingredients and their quantities, these assessments take into account how the recipe is stored both before and after preparation, how it's cooked, um, as well as any packaging that might um, be used during service if that's relevant to your business. The pros of recipe level footprinting are that a lot of times shifting businesses' recipes um, or an outlet sales mix is one of the more straightforward ways to reduce impact. But similar to product level reporting, anytime you get more specific, it does come a bit at the expense of breadth. A quick note before moving on is just while I've presented these frameworks as separate from each other, there is a really natural intersection between them. Um, some businesses, and in fact, a lot of businesses might undertake all of them at some point in service of their goals. One example of how that might work is that if you start with a goal of wanting to submit to SBTI, um, and you do a scope three assessment of the food and drink that your business buys every year, you might determine from that, that most of your emissions are coming from say the mozzarella cheese that you're putting on your pizza. So that's actually very common for pizza restaurants. Um, you might identify a new goal to look more specifically at that mozzarella to understand the hot spots um, of impact in that product. And that would lead you to start a product level footprint the results of that product footprint can actually be fed back into the scope three assessment. So it's not just moving from one to the other, they kind of have a circular um, process, but just really what's key is ensuring that you're always clear about why you're performing an assessment and how that fits into your goals. So now that you've determined what your goal is, maybe what assessment framework you wanna to use to achieve that goal, it's time to take that last step towards measurement, which is looking at the practicalities of how you're gonna gather the necessary data to perform the assessment. A lot of that will depend on who you are as business um, and then what is both within and outside of your organizational control. So what is within your organizational control signals the pieces of data that you likely already have yourself. And therefore that's a really good starting point for data collection and collation and not to give away the ending or roses section of this presentation, but looking ahead, those are also the levers that you can really easily pull when you move past measurement and into sort of the managing um, side of impact. Of course, just because something's within your organizational control does not mean that you have this data super easily on hand. So don't worry if it takes some coordination across departments or multiple iterations of assessments to set up the necessary structures to collect this data regularly. But as I've said, 
What's within your control depends largely on what type of organization you are. I've listed out a couple different organization types here that you might characterize yourself as. Maybe you're one of these, maybe you actually operate as multiple of them. Um, and then I've also listed a few pieces of data that you likely have if this is you. So if you are a farm um, or a primary producer organization, you're likely sitting on loads of crucial information about the crops and the animals that you produce. So that can include the conditions that um, of the land that the farm is located on, inputs and practices that allow you to create the best quality product, and the quantity of your output, as well as knowledge of the upstream actors that you are supplying to many of which might be ingredient suppliers and ingredient suppliers will have those relationships with their producers and know the quantities that they're purchasing from those producers but um, they also know where the factories are how the products get made um, and where they are sent on to afterwards which might be a retailer and if you are a retailer you have data on who's supplying your shelves and how much you're purchasing from them, as well as how those products are reaching you as well, and some of the layout and functionality of your stores and warehouses. And last but not least, we have restaurants or food service catering organizations who likely have access to recipes um, and cooking instructions, but also they know who the suppliers are of the ingredients that goes into those recipes, as well as the sales volumes of their outlets. Regardless of where you are on the spectrum of organizations, it's really good to look at all the other actors on this list and think about the roles that they play in your own supply chain, because it's pretty unlikely that you're going to be able to successfully perform your measurements without the data that they also hold. But as I said, we do recommend starting your data collection efforts at home, because that is what you're most likely able to control. Um, and what you can get started on while you're reaching out to all of those other actors in your supply chain. So there you go. You have stated your goals. You've maybe chosen an assessment framework and you have hopefully identified some pieces of data that you will and will not have in your organizational control. That should put you in a really good place to get started. Um, but before I pass it on to Rose, I just wanted to touch on a couple of general kind of tips and tricks um, from my experience helping clients with their impact measurements. So just a few things to keep in mind as you move on from planning towards execution of this type of project. The first of which is I recommend that you choose a dedicated internal point person to lead on the project. Um, we have found that even if a lot of the data is coming from your suppliers or third parties, having that internal lead is really helpful. Um, would recommend that you choose a project lead who has influence across multiple departments and some awareness of the life cycle assessment process. Obviously, they don't have to be an expert. That's my job. Um, but, you know, some technical understanding is an asset. Um, many of our clients will have a sustainability manager who can take this on. But if you don't have a sustainability manager, that's also totally fine. Other clients can um, find someone within either the commercial or supply chain ops teams who can lead. Just to note that these projects do take time and this time likely comes out of normal responsibilities. So make sure you think about that ahead of time. Um, next, we have uh, recommend that you build carbon literacy within your business and environmental awareness as well. Um, either before or whilst doing these type of assessments, we, we often find that um, impact measurements either start within one department within a business um, or within a couple of employees. And then there are, there are employees who aren't directly involved, but need to be consulted during data collection. And they can feel kind of out of the loop on what the assessment is and, and why they're important. So at the start of the project, we really recommend that um, our clients take a moment to have internal discussions around what these assessments are, why they're happening now, what they can and can't do, um, and how environmental management can fit into regular business practice. This really helps stakeholders across the business um, get on board and make the assessment most usable and actionable once it's complete. Next, we have that it is really important to really engage with your suppliers and your supply chain throughout the process. I know I mentioned just a minute ago that it's really good to start with the data that you already have yourself, but your suppliers will always be a crucial part of this process and their cooperation and buy-in will shape the outcomes of the project. So it's really important that they're on board. 
Um, we found a really good way to do this is just to appeal to the benefits of the project for them. So even if you're the one that's consolidating all the data and performing all the calculations, you can still promise to share the results with them, particularly maybe the piece of the assessment that they contributed to and engage them in conversations around what do these results mean and how you can uh, improve your sustainability together. And then finally, I just recommend that you treat your first project as a pilot and try and learn from it. The first time you take this type of project on, you're very likely to be hit with a bunch of surprises. Um, there might be big gaps in the amount of primary data that you're able to collect and maybe need to fall back on way more secondary data than you thought, or maybe there are places where you actually just have too much data and you're kind of struggling to weed through it and make sense of it all. That's totally normal. It's in fact really part of the learning process. So don't worry if that happens to you. Um, in future years, you can always set up systems to track some of those data points that you couldn't track in the past and kind of iterate on the things that did and did not previously work. So now that I have covered the basics and before I move on, I will very quickly highlight a few tools you might wanna check out to help you get started. As Rose mentioned at the start of this presentation here at Food Steps, we have our own platform that can provide you with insights on your food footprint, and we can support with all of the assessment frameworks that I previously mentioned. But here are some other great free complementary tools for you to use as you go about your sustainability target setting and investigation. One in particular, um, which we'd encourage you to have a look at, would be the RAPS Food and Beverage Emissions Factor Database. We uh, collaborated with them on the first and second version of that. But of course, the best way to ensure you're getting these measurements right and turning them into something useful is by pulling in some help from a trusted advisor or expert who can really help you make sense of everything. So now I will pass over to Rose, who is going to talk a little bit more about what comes next after you've measured your food's impact. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Maura. Um, so, uh, yeah, like Maura said, I'm going to talk you through how you can turn uh, all those impact data into new targets. And we're also going to give you some tips on how you might be able to focus on emissions reductions. So measurement is obviously a really fundamental step to thinking about emissions reduction. And as Maura said earlier, it's important that you learn from your pilot and you run with those learnings to help you set up for success, set up a system that allows you to keep tracking your impact as smoothly as possible. Um, and how you reduce your emissions will be specific to um, what you're choosing to measure, what type of business you are, the scale that you're measuring. We'll go into that in just a second. Uh, Maura highlighted that you could be interested in corporate reporting or product recipe level reporting. So reduction techniques are likely to look a bit different for each of those, um, although the benefits will be reaped um, no matter like what you choose. So there's a few little things for you to consider when it actually comes down to uh, creating your reduction roadmap. So firstly, what's your starting point or, or what we call an emissions baseline? So this will demonstrate how much scope there is for reductions. So if your starting point is pretty high, for example, in terms of emissions, there's a greater potential for dramatic shifts in that impact. Um, and those initial reductions will actually be easier off the bat. Uh, these shifts might be more incremental if you're starting from quite a low point. So go big or go home, basically. Um, and then secondly, so you'll need to figure out what you're aiming for and the time frame in which you're hoping to achieve these reductions. So is it 30% by 2030 or net zero by 2050, for example, or is it both? Um, and what does that look like year on year? So once again, like Maura said, be realistic, use your pilot as a kind of test for uh, the destination and the frame. Um, carbon hotspots and reduction opportunities. So we're gonna go into this in a little bit more detail. So your baseline measurement should be really useful for identifying where your supply chain carbon hotspots exactly are so you can pinpoint them. Um, but it will also give you a sense um, of the opportunities for reduction. So for most food businesses, hotspots are likely to show up at the primary production stage or the farm stage as Maura previously showed. Um, 
some easy wins here for emissions reduction might look like swapping out your highest emitting ingredients. Uh, but we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But generally speaking, it's important that you are realistic about how much you can achieve and by when. Although that's not to say you shouldn't be ambitious. Um, it's important in the long term that you are realistic about your targets. So a bit more on target setting. Uh, there are frameworks that already exist. Uh, and a key organization that we wanted to highlight uh, that is pioneering reduction reductions targets for businesses is uh, currently the uh, Science-Based Targets Initiative, or SBTI, as some of you might be familiar with. Um, some of you might not be familiar with this. this uh, it's a pretty standardized way for companies to support progress on halving UK emissions by 2030, a target that we're all familiar with by this point. Uh, and reach net zero emissions by 2050. Luckily, SBTI has developed a comprehensive framework around target setting for land intensive businesses specifically. Um, land intensive businesses are ones with significant uh, emissions in forest, land or agricultural activities. Uh, although downstream food businesses, so downstream looks like uh, restaurants or retailers may not think that they fit into this land intensive category. It actually is really referring to any business where your emissions are going to make up more than 20% of your overall total, um, which is likely to encompass quite a lot of food businesses. So whilst this new framework is um, maybe a little bit overwhelming, if you're not an expert, we highly do encourage you to learn about this. We actually do have a little guide on this um, that Sophie, one of our impact managers wrote. So I will make sure to include that in the follow-up notes or if you're watching this online in the link below. Uh, a bit more on target setting. So if you're looking to create targets specifically at the recipe and product level, like Maura previously mentioned, uh, we have actually created our own intensity target that allows you to align all your recipes and your food to the Paris Climate Agreement, so 1.5 degrees, and it helps keep your food uh, within the systems of a safe operating limit for our climate. So both SBTI and this particular target are ultimately striving for the same thing. So um, aiming for dishes to be within the safe operating limit for our, pl uh, our planet and our climate. Um, although achieving one shouldn't limit you to trying to achieve the other, they actually work quite um, cohesively. Although it's important to state that um, they uh, do focus on different aspects of reporting. So for this particular target, we have opted for a carbon intensity target as the key metric, um, which means essentially that we can place lots of different businesses um, who are operating in lots of different places on lots of different scales on a level playing field, which we think is really important. Um, you might be more familiar with the term carbon footprint target. So why have we chosen carbon intensity? Um, we have chosen carbon intensity uh, per kilo of food procured or sold. So it's not affected by the size of your business or how much food you're buying or selling. It's uh, just about what uh, you are buying or selling. So it's about inbound and outbound is the difference. Um, I see that we've got a question in the chat, but I will get to that in just a second. So uh, super, super quickly, when we're talking about targets and the Food Steps platform, some of you here on the call have actually used our platform before. Uh, you'll be familiar with this. This actually tracks and reports the average carbon intensity of recipes uploaded. Uh, so this little bit on your dashboard will show you basically uh, how you are doing in terms of reaching that target and how far you've got left to go. So as Maura mentioned, uh, we wanted to share some kind of like tips and tricks about different ways that you can engage and actively reduce impact across your supply chain. Um, this is actually like fundamental, but we have identified some key intervention points. So this could be really helpful for you to kind of map the key um, beats, I guess, that you want to hit when creating your targets and the pathway that you're going to use to get there. So the first one is procurement, like we've mentioned. Next one is recipes. Then we've got operations sales and marketing. Some people bunch sales and marketing together, but we think it's important for you to kind of maybe separate them. Um, obviously, we do recognize that this is simplifying the supply chain quite drastically. Um, your supply chain is probably gonna look more complex than this, and it's gonna differ from business to business. So take all of this as kind of like a foundational understanding, but hopefully it will give you a flavor of what you could be thinking about strategically. So, 
Let's talk about procurement. Uh, so as a starting point, uh, you could, could set up sustainability standards for your suppliers um, on the first point here. So as a food business, how and where you're sourcing your ingredients from are likely to be big hitters when it comes to your carbon footprint particularly when you're thinking about the primary stages Maura mentioned, where dis big decisions are being made about uh, how your ingredients are being farmed, how they're being processed, how the land is being used. Uh, for restaurants and caterers and retailers, these are maybe decisions that will fall largely out of your control. However, there is no reason why you can't engage your suppliers who maybe have gauged with their ingredient producers. Um, it, it could be a really helpful initiative um, to think about this. Um, one tip that you could have is that you could make your own sustainable procurement policy, which you expect all your suppliers to comply with. Um, but I'll show you an example of what that could look like on the next slide. Um, but on the second point, so work with your suppliers to help reduce their impact. This is uh, quite important. It is a bit more laborious, but we do encourage you to give it a go. It's important to remember that your suppliers, especially the smaller ones, may need a bit of support and guidance when it comes to impact reductions and meeting these new standards, such as SBTI or some other standards that you are trying to uh, put in place. So you might want to engage with them a little bit more on this, uh, work together, work collaboratively to reduce their impact, which is ultimately going to help you. Um, it will be a net positive. So we have um, collaborated with a number of our clients' suppliers uh, to, bespore, uh, to perform bespoke uh, carbon footprint assessments. Uh, so this has helped them get a better read on where the emissions are actually coming from within their supply chain. So in terms of the sustainable procurement policy, while it is the responsibility of your suppliers to ensure that they're upholding the relevant standards, it's your responsibility as their buyer to hold them accountable and ensure they're practicing what they preach. Um, although that doesn't mean you're going to have a bit of a harder line, it is going to serve you in the future. So here on this slide, as you can see, we have crafted our own uh, kind of like template, I guess you could treat it as a sustainability policy that Sophie, uh, one of our impact managers who I've just mentioned, uh, put together for us. Uh, yeah, wouldn't recommend that you screen grab this and take this verbatim, uh, use it as a template, perhaps. Uh, it could help you with some ideas around what could be in your own sustainable procurement policy, such as, you know, what certificates do you want to include? Um, and this could give you a good idea of what your suppliers could be doing in the long term. So now for the fun bit that I think all of us are very, very familiar with, let's talk about recipes. Um, one of the tips that we have is identifying your highest emitting recipes and make sustainable swaps where you can. So obviously this is at the recipe level. So this could look like shaking up what's on your menu, um, what kind of particular ingredients you're putting in your products. Uh, once you've measured your carbon footprint, like Maura mentioned at the start, um, you can begin starting at looking at ways that you can swap things in and out to reduce that impact overall. The second one is commit to reducing your highest impacting ingredients. Uh, it's probably time to start altering your recipes, swapping out, like I said, the higher impacting ones for the lower ones that you're able to identify. Uh, this is particularly relevant if you're a restaurant or a caterer who has more dynamic uh, menus that you're able to you know, change, whether it be like seasonally or around particular um, times of the year or particular days um, compared to food brands who maybe have like particular product offerings that you know you can't really change and you're a bit more limited. That's not to say that um, we wouldn't encourage you if you are a product company to think about how you can make those small tweaks within your recipes. Um, cool. When we talk about targets with, um, it could be quite useful to put down on paper exactly what those are. So whilst you're creating these targets and you're setting this out strategically and, um, you know, setting, like Maura said, a, uh, a time frame, it could be really quite handy. So an example of this could look like you could focus on the top five to 10% of your highest uh, carbon recipes or your best sellers. So go for the ones that are emitting the most, or if you want to have more positive impact over time, maybe look to reducing the impact of your best sellers because if they're selling the most and you reduce the impact of those, that's gonna be a net benefit for you in the future. Um, 
It could also be quite useful to think about setting a target for um, phasing out particularly high emitting ingredients. Um, so an example here that some of our clients is like reducing uh, red meat, for example, which is typically quite high um, in our, the rating scale. Um, however, we know that this isn't going to be for every single brand. If you are a brand that is heavily reliant on meat, for example, chicken, beef, pork, those particular kind of things, um, there's some other kind of like hidden wins that you could have in terms of phasing out high um, impact uh, ingredients. So this could be like um, mixing out margarine and um, dairy butter. So dairy is high emitting, swap out for margarine, uh, your customers probably aren't going to notice. Or another particular example could be if you have a burger patty, for example, and you're still opting for beet, um, maybe take 20% of that, blend in some lentils and pulses, something that's got lower impact with the rest of the meat. So you'll be reducing that impact just a little bit over time. So now I'm going to talk about operations. While there is a lot that might be happening that is outside of your control, there's a lot that can be achieved within your own business's remit. So a relatively low hanging fruit that you could tackle quite easily, obviously budget depending, uh, is energy sources. So switching to renewable energies or maybe um, energy efficient uh, appliances where possible. This could be electrical appliances if you're able to purchase new equipment. A second one could just like thinking very simply about food preparation and food um, food waste efficiency in cooking. Uh, so there's a few tips in terms of cooking that you could use to improve efficiency. For example, increasing the batch size. So if you're cooking a lot of things at once, use a full oven, as we call it. Uh, so you can cut the cooking time um, as well. An example could be yeah, using the hob instead of the oven, which uses elect uh, less uh, energy. Um, or you could even start using passive cooking techniques. I think this works for pasta, potatoes, and many other starchy products. Um, also, if you're trying to save uh, energy, it's also going to have uh, an impact of lowering some costs for you, which is always great. Um, and the third one, implement a waste management strategy. We know that food uh, waste management is always going to be a problem. Um, I'll build a little bit more on this in the next slides. Uh, but make sure you have a system in place or if you don't have a system in place already, uh, work towards having one uh, for appropriate waste separation, favouring compost for food that goes to landfill, um, reuse and repurpose whatever surplus food that you can. Uh, for example, uh, you could use vegetables uh, offcuts in a vegetable stock. Uh, I saw that recently M&S is committed to reusing stale bread uh, for their frozen garlic bread range, um, which I think is actually quite a smart initiative. Um, so just a little bit more on repurposing waste. Uh, we, all of us already in the room, know that food waste is a really major environmental problem. Uh, and it also feeds into social issues such as food poverty. So um, a little stat here to kind of like bring it on home. So in the UK alone, approximately 9.5 million tonnes of food waste, uh, food is wasted annually. So unfortunately, we know that no amount of sales forecasting is going to avoid food waste entirely. Although it's important to try, uh, there are other initiatives like we've got here on the slides uh, that can help um, when there's inevitability. So we've got Olio, Too Good To Go, the Felix Project. These are all really great ones for redistributing food waste. Um, and then we're just going to have a, two more slides on marketing or a couple of more slides on marketing. So um, I wanted to mention uh, when we think about marketing, start thinking about marketing through the lens of an educational tool rather as well as a sales tool. Obviously, that is its main purpose. Um, right now, we know that a majority of the UK consumers believe that food companies should start offering low carbon intensive options. So, you know, whether it's like having a vegan range or a low impact range. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the consumer actually knows what that looks like in terms of tons of CO2, what that actually means in terms of what you need to change within your supply chain and hard work that you have to go through. So we offer, or I would advise on like a two pronged approach um, when it comes to using marketing as an educational tool. So the first one is uh, internal. So um, we're thinking about your HQ, we're thinking about the shop floor and your staff. Uh, so think about your staff, you know, um, you want them to come on this journey with you and also to understand the value of why you are doing all this hard work to reduce your impact in the first place. And what does that fundamentally mean? And number two, um, 
you know, like Maura said at the beginning, try and get them to bolster their carbon literacy. Uh, this is absolutely fundamental, we think. Um, so this could look like in some examples that our clients have used that I help them with um, is integrating our partnership into maybe like their onboarding packs for new joiners. If you have online modules for new joiners, you could put in something there like a little fun quiz or something that's like brief and educational, just those top line data points that we could or your data provider could provide for you. Um, or maybe some dedicated training days for your culinary or chef staff. And then when we're thinking about customers, so the usual way that we think about marketing, which is outbound, uh, customers need to actually know what is the difference between high and low carbon options. Uh, so you could use labels, for example, so that enables them to say, hey, I'm here on my lunch break. OK, I see a red thing and I see a green thing. OK, green usually means good. Cool. I'll go for that. It's a quick little decision. You take all the hassle out for them. Um, but it also doesn't need to be labels in particular. It can also be when you're going through this journey and you're setting these targets and you're doing this work, think about the stories that you can pull out from this, you know, whether it's how you work with your farmers or your supply chain or whether there are any like social impacts that was also a potential like runoff benefit. Um, you can all use this in your marketing campaigns. And as long as you've got the data to back it up, which you will if you use a data provider, then all of your claims will be green claims code uh, safe. Um, some other kind of like initiatives that you could think about is like placing low carbon options front and center, like I said, in the lunchtime rush, introducing like low carbon Tuesdays or, you know, like we're all familiar with Domino's two for Tuesdays, maybe try like low carbon specific offerings, maybe buy one, get one free if you uh, purchase a low one. Um, and you could also think about carbon labeling. I wanted to share some examples of exactly like what customer facing comms could look like, because uh, one thing that we know is, um, some some people are a little bit hesitant to try it. We hear you. It can be quite scary putting your sustainable claims out there. So this is an example of how one of our clients did it. So this example comes from Gather and Gather, which is a coffee uh, coffee shop. Uh, it's part of the CH and Co group. So they put labels on uh, their coffee off coffee offering, and they did a life cycle assessment, like Maura mentioned at the beginning, um, and they used that data to help uh, create digital signage that was post, uh, posted up in one of their cafeterias, one of their cafe sections uh, to help tell a story. So if you kind of squint here, you can see like the first slide is like an engaging kind of story. Then it shows you the labels. What does that actually look like? What does that actually mean? It mentions about uh, the partnership in itself. And then it offers up some kind of interesting data that is based off the particular coffee and the milk that they serve. So did you know, da, 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 you could save this amount of carbon, uh, but then you bring it back to a real world equivalent. So, you know, the, like I said, the average consumer isn't going to know what 4.14 kilograms of CO2 actually means or looks like. So you bring it to an equivalent and you say uh, that's 500 times you've charged your smartphone. And here are some examples of like what it actually looked like when you put it there. And it wasn't just the screen. We had the carbon labels on the menus as well. We had a little A-frame with some more kind of, you know, if you wanted to swap out cow's milk for oat milk or vice versa on your latte, your Americano, your flat white, what would that actually look like? And then it sent you through to a QR code, which had um, all the methodology and all the things that they needed to make sure their code, uh, their claims were green claims code compliant. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit more of a tangible idea of exactly how you can use marketing and the data within your framework of setting your targets to help, you know, you've done the hard work, you've set all your targets, you're reaching them, now you've got to tell your customers about it. We want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, like I said, we will be sharing uh, the follow-up notes and some interesting kind of like afterthoughts that we've had um, from this conversation. Uh, we want to thank you again. And uh, we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.